So the title of the talk, the relief for your employee management headache. I know that sounds maybe a little cynical, but everybody I talk to, the biggest challenge is not managing cows. Turns out the biggest challenge is managing people. And that's any industry. People are, are typically the hardest, uh, hardest part of your, your management day. So what do we do? We could fire everyone, but uh, we all know that's not really going to work. I know everybody's probably had that day, or a week, or a month, where you say, hey, it should be nice to go back to 100,000, I just do it myself. But we know that we're past that now, so we're going to have to figure out how to do it without, of course, firing everyone. So what do we do? Do we hire mind readers? I have a, um, an assistant right now with my business, and I thought, boy, it would be really nice if she could read my mind. Everything I want to do, one step before I needed it, she was already there. But again, that's not going to work out either. So if we can't fire everyone, and we can't find people who just read our minds when we need them to do it, at the very least, we got to be picky. We're not going to spend too much time on what it takes to build the team, what we have to do to, um, to be picky. But I think before we even start an employee management talk, a uh, talk on employee management, we have to find good quality people. Regardless of all the strategies you put in place, in, in, the, in the case of strategic employee management, all the things you can put in place won't work if you don't have people that are good hires. And when I tell, when I tell my customers, it's sort of like what your dairy is, is, it's your portfolio, your stock portfolio. Imagine, if you will, you've got a $10 million stock, stock portfolio and you're looking for somebody to help you manage that. You're willing to hire 20 people to help manage it. Too often we forget what we've got. Your dairy is a million, multi-million dollar portfolio that is going to provide for you today, your tomorrow, and of course your future. So when people drive in the, in the yard, I never understand why five guys come looking for a job all at the same time. I mean, who do we hire? The driver? We know he's got a car. But now if you were trying to take your $20 million stock portfolio, would you just have the guy who drives in your yard? Would you just hire him to manage your portfolio? Knocks on the door and says, hi, my name is Bernie Madoff. Would you hire him? A lot of times we're doing it. We're just taking whoever comes up to the door and say, hey, if your cousins are this guy, good enough for us. And that's not good enough. We've got to be, we've got to be a little more selective in how we pick people. But once we got people on the team, we've got this thing what I call a rookie window. It's from day one, the day that you first hire a guy, to the day he's actually, how do I say this in the next way, to he's actually valuable to your team. It's that rookie window where everybody costs money because they're learning, they're making mistakes, and that's part of the rookie window. Regardless of your business, regardless of the level that you're hiring people at, you've got rookie windows all over the place. With my assistant, she's um, right out of college, her first job ever. And she's awesome, I couldn't have picked a better person. But we've got a rookie window, and that, that requires a lot of communication to put things like this together. It took a lot of communication to get all the details put together. And it might take a month, it might take three. It might take a week. And with your milkers, whoever on your dairy, you've got a rookie window that you've got to close quick. And that's why I want, to, I want to work with you guys today on how do you keep the rookie window as small as possible and not let anybody fall back into it. Because a lot of times we have guys who are no longer rookies, but for some reason they just stray back into a rookie window. And we scratch our heads saying, how does he make these mistakes? We know he knows what he's doing. How did he just make the, a rookie mistake? We just got a hot tank of milk. A guy, a guy who's been here three years doesn't know to check the cooler. All right. I mean, that's what we're trying to work on. So how do we close that rookie window? I think there's, before we get to the five reasons, I think there's five principles across the top that organize, organize our systems, communicate expectations. We talk about connecting, that's connecting one-on-one. -on -one. Manage and lead, pretty self-explanatory. And then finally, talk about rewarding performance. So we're going to talk about the five principles, I call it teamworks, because if we do this, our team works. The five principles of effective employee management, but before, before we get into all those, let's figure out what are the five reasons on the handbook, that little handout I give you, that little booklet, there's a, a page on there that talks about the five reasons in more depth. I don't want to spend too much time. I've only got about 45 minutes to, to cover a day's worth of stuff. So, but first we have to understand why we don't deliver, why our teams don't deliver. Five reasons. I think, number one, wrong person hired. We've all heard that, that saying about we've got this bus and we've got to put the right people in the right seats on that bus. That's what we're talking about. Maybe you hired the wrong guy. Or maybe you hired the right guy and put him in the wrong, uh, the wrong seat on that bus. Oftentimes that's what happens. Inadequate resources. Typically that's just not having the tools. You know, we put a guy out with broken rakes and we ask him to do a better job of breaking salts. Or we just don't have 
We just don't have the materials a guy needs. You know, we give him a spoon when he needs a shovel. So, as a manager, you want to make sure that everybody has the adequate resources to do the job, otherwise, of course, you can't do it. You know, you, you can't give a guy a bicycle to, to drive down to Chicago. That's me. Uh, a lot of times, I find that another reason that guys, uh, a team doesn't get things done is they don't know what to do. Don't be told. You hire somebody, just keep that out there, that rookie window goes on forever because nobody's told them what to do, how to do it. That's just not even, not even part of the management piece. If we've told them what to do, the next question is, do they understand? I'm speaking English. Everybody here is, most everybody is native English speakers, but for the most part, our teams are Spanish speaking here in the US. So we can talk all day in English to a guy who speaks Spanish, and I, I pick on, I, I pick on my, my family. I had a friend from Chihuahua, Mexico, lived with our family for a, a year and a half. And um, my relatives would talk to Omar real loud and slow. Well, he wasn't deaf <laughs> or dumb. He just didn't speak English. So we've got to understand that it's not just speaking words, making sure people understand what we say. So we're talking a little bit more about that. And finally, the last one I think is the biggest problem. Is people just don't care. The top four, that's on your shoulders. Managers, that's your responsibility to get to get the right people hired, have the resources for them when they are, so they know what to do, they understand how to do it. And if you give them those four, I'll tell you what, the fifth one's on them. Once in a while, it could be your fault if a guy doesn't care what he's doing, because then we'll talk about that because we just don't give enough reasons for a guy to really want to do a job, a good job. But most of the time, it's attitude. It's a person's, their attitude that says, hey, I want to be here and do this well, or I don't. So that's typically, the fifth one is typically where we draw the line and say, hey, we've done everything we can, now it's up to you. Okay? So let's talk about those five principles. The first one, I put a lot of uh, pages in those in that handbook for organized. There's a lot of stuff, and I don't want to overdo it, because not one of these five are more important than the others. But I think if we don't organize well, if we don't lay a good foundation, it's like building a house of cards. Everything's going to fall apart. So first things first, we have to be prepared and not just prepared, but to succeed. A lot of times, I work with areas that just aren't organized at all. They just don't have anything in place, anything written down. No real structures or systems in place. So we're just shooting from the hip all the time. And every new problem, we have a new solution. Instead of saying, okay, let's just let's sit down and have a strategy. Before you build your next bar, you probably know where you're going to put it, right? And then you have an idea of how big it's going to be. And then you build a plan, draw a plan out, and you know the materials, and then you figure out what it's going to cost. Why don't we do this when it comes to our teams? I know it's a lot of work, but it's a lot more work without it. So we have to be organized for one, because if we don't, our team guesses the expectations. They have no idea, they're just kind of thinking, they're now really the mind readers here, trying to figure out what the boss wants. And then on the flip side, you're stuck managing consistently. I kind of talked about that already, because there is no standard on how we handle things. One day we might have a problem, so we give a raise to solve it. The next day, we got a good guy who wants to raise, but we don't have any money. So how do we how do we solve our problems? How do we address our issues consistently? We we need to get organized. The next thing is when we do have things organized, a lot of times the design and fail. Well, I want to talk on that one. There's policies and routines that we need to put in place, of course, but a lot of times they don't work. This and I won't stray too much from this, the the subject, but a few weeks ago. I, I was going to a tailgate party and made some coleslaw. I asked my mom to give me the recipe. It's my grandma's old recipe. I thought I can do this. So I just went from top to bottom. I just started doing stuff. And none of it was in order. The first thing was half a cup of vinegar. The next thing was sugar. Well, I don't realize that if you put sugar in a wet cup, all the sugar sticks to the, to the cup. All, they, all my grandma would have to do was write the sugar first and then the vinegar, and I would have been fine, right? But things were out of order. And the, the rest is a mess anyway. So, but the, the point is, if we don't explain things in the right order, if we don't organize the details, we're bound to fail from the start. When we look at routines, I see more milking routines that are built to fail from the start. What we do is we tell everybody, okay, step one, dip, strip, dip, four cow prep. Then we come back through, wipe and attach, wipe and attach. Then they go off to the next group next territory, and we go, that's our routine. Two steps, dip, strip, dip, wipe, and attach. What do we tell everybody on where to put dippers, 
when to fill towels, when to spray water, when to put towels in your pouch. We don't design our routines to truly work. And when we're trying to figure out where we lose our time, it's not one through four, one through four, dip, strip, dip, wipe, and attach. Everybody's got that down, they know what they gotta do, assuming they do. It's everything in between. I watch this. If, if I'm putting this clicker down in, the, in a different place every time, I'm always walking back trying to find where I put it. Kind of annoying, right? I watch more milkers go down the, down the line, I just said it, post clicker down, and then they're over here. Where did the post clicker oh, It's never in the same place. And what we have in lean manufacturing, where people actually paint lines on the floor of where to put a pallet, or where we put a sign on the, on the, on the wall to say, this is where clean towels go, and this is three, we need to spell it out. Our routines need to be designed to, to work. Too often we design them so they don't. So when I, when I preach about milking routines, I talk about, hey, we, we've got to have our pre-dippers here. We've got to always have our post-dippers there. As a manager, you walk in and you see them out of place. We gotta get back on track. We gotta have things organized to uh, to succeed. Okay. The tools when it comes to organizing. In every job in your dairy, you got tools, right? You got skid steers, you got tractors. You you got everything you need to get jobs done. What are your tools that you use on a daily basis to manage your people? Most people don't have tools that they utilize to manage people. We've got things like a new hire kit. I think of that as an application, all the paperwork, the I-9s, the W-4, stuff like that, any new hire paperwork. So that once somebody comes in, you can just say, here's what I need, here's what I got. In fact, I have a Jerry that's about an hour from here. She said, I have a Jerry client about an hour from here. We got everything set up. He said, you don't know the freedom I have when people walk in my yard now. I can give them an application. We put the job description, the pay scales right on the wall, so that I can just point them. Instead of having to walk them around and tell them all these, answer all these questions that they have. I can point them to the applications, the job descriptions, and the pay scales. And now I, I'm in control. I can tell him what I expect from day one. If he doesn't want to do that, it doesn't happen. Before it was running around and kind of figuring out what, how much he wanted to work for, how much what he wanted to do, and look, here's what we got. If you want to be part of this, welcome aboard. But if you don't, this is how we do it. So those are tools from day one. It was so much easier for him to uh, to manage his dairy from start from the very first day because everything was in, in place. Org charts. I put two pages in your booklet there. One, to just look at the, the different departments, I consider departments of your, your company, and put names on those sheets. From there, take a look at that org chart, kind of that tree of the, um, different positions. What I found a lot of times, and right off, the, right off the bat, the reason why we failed, you'll start putting your, same, your name in like, five areas, <laughs> and then pretty soon you realize you're managing everybody, and you have a job, something's got to give. Something's got to give. And you know that you've got to get the cows fed, so that can't give, right? You know that you've got to do shots, so we can't not do that. But the workers are there. The cows are coming up to the parlor, and they're going back. It looks like they're getting milk because there's milk in the tank. So we don't have to manage people anymore. Something had to give. So what we have to do is, when we, when we start this whole thing out, I think we have to always start with the org chart. So we can really get an understanding of, okay, if I'm going to be a good coach, do I have to run the whole team, or are we going to delegate? And that's that part. Employee manuals, I'm a little cynical, and I want to be a little careful on that. Almost, I feel like I'm sometimes, sometimes hypocritical on that part, because I don't really believe in employee manuals, but I never do it without. They're one of those pieces, it's sort of like insurance. An employee manual is really just like insurance. You know that you probably won't have a fire, but if you have one, Sure, be nice to have some insurance. So you probably don't need to have all the policies that your attorney wants you to have, but when you do, you got a policy in place. So when it comes to employee manuals, I'm not a huge fan of them, although I believe 100% of them, because I know we're not going to use them all the time, but the time that we do, for example, if we want to talk about um, pay advances, instead of having to talk to the guys about, hey, we do or we don't get pay advances, just refer to page four, there's a policy on pay advances. Cell phones, everybody's running around talking on their cell phones. Hey, uh, page nine, there's this policy about cell phones. Here's the here's consequence if you break that policy on page nine. People want to know what are the paid holidays or what do I do with insurance. Check your, check your employee manual. That's why we have it, right? Job descriptions, pay skills, and evaluations. To me, those three come together as one. We'll talk a little bit more about that in detail, actually quite a bit, when we get to the reward section, so I'll leave that for that. SOPs, that's the recipes for work. Kind of talking about how if we, if we write a good SOP and have it translated correctly, 
They can be really effective. In fact, I don't know how we do it without. Uh, and then written warnings. I've included two of those in the back of your booklet. Uh, they're just carbonless copies. A lot of times what I, I feel is we've got issues that we need to address, but we don't address them because we don't have a way to do it. We don't have a form. It's not translated. It's a hassle to write all that stuff down. So if we have a really simple, really simple warning procedure there that you got one page, double cop, or a duplicate there, fill it out, you sign it, they sign it, split it in half, throw it in their file, it's done. You don't have to wait a month to get a written warning until the guy like me comes out in the area and, and deals with that. Okay? Let's move on to communicate. Communication is so much more than just speaking the same language. A good friend of mine was telling the, telling the joke that, hey, if it was just about language, my wife and I speak English. It's not just about the language. Communication is so much more. And that's the part for me that, that's kind of tough is that, you know, we, when I talk to Jamie about this whole piece of training and communicating, I say, well, you know, we've got, we've got so-and-so, he's bilingual. We'll just have him tell everybody. Not everybody on the team is a communicator. Just because they speak Spanish, just because they speak English, doesn't make them the person that you want to go to. You look at politicians, right or wrong, they're good speakers, right? They're almost too good. There's an art to that. Not everybody wants to get up and, and talk to a group and explain what's wrong and what's right and who needs to fix it. So it's more than just saying, hey, we got a guy who speaks English or we got a guy who speaks Spanish. It's communication is a much bigger piece than that. To me, communication is maintenance. Everybody does parlor maintenance, right? Change liners, right? Everybody does skid steer maintenance. Change filters, check the oil. How often do we do that? As often as we need to, right? But when it comes to people, we only maintain, do this maintenance with people, this communication piece when there's a problem. So now right off the bat, everybody knows that, hey, if somebody's got to get talked to, with, or if somebody wants to talk to you, if the boss wants to talk to you, it's because there's a problem. So instead of doing the maintenance because we need to, and make sure that things are right, we wait until there's a problem. So we have to look, we have to do, uh, I guess we have to be a little more proactive when it comes to communication. I'm a big believer in both the formal and the informal pieces of communication. Formal being the employee meetings. I think monthly is what we got to do, four to five weeks. Because everybody strays. I don't care what job you have. If it's a, if it's a real simple, um, simple routine or if it's really complicated, we all have a tendency to stray from what we know is right. We're on that road and procedural drift kicks in and we're way off back in the rookie window. So if we wait too long, we just leave that window get bigger and bigger on the rookie window. Evaluations, I think every three, six, 12 months. I know some guys would say, hey, every 12 months we're going to do an employee evaluation. Um, that's like saying, hey, honey, I told you I, I loved you on our, on our wedding night, and if anything would ever change, I'd let you know. I know it's been 10 years since I told you, but I told you the night we got married. I love you then, I love you now. But you got to do it a little more frequently than once every year, once every 10 years. Every three months, every six months, that would probably help. Because again, people stray off from their, from their procedure, we got to be back. But I don't want to focus too much on the whole formal piece. I want to talk a little bit more about the informal communication. And the idea about giving frequent feedback. I'm a huge believer in the frequent fee feedback as an informal piece. Because every day you interact with people, hopefully. And we can't just go in there and say, hey, you're doing a good job. I put that in, the, in, that, in that notebook. Instead of going in and telling somebody, hey, you're doing a good job, say something specific all the time. Because you're doing a good job doesn't mean anything. What does that mean that I'm doing a good job? Am I doing a good job not going in the holding area? Good seat coverage? Pulling the gas on time? Uh, cleaning up after myself? What is, what, when I say you're doing a good job, what do I mean? We have to be specific because when we're specific, we can actually fix it or continue to do it. If it's a problem, and say, hey, you're just not doing if you tell one of your milkers he's not doing a good job, do you know where he's going first, he, what he thinks? Too slow. So I'll send him going faster. Because now you'll notice he's doing a good job. But it might not have anything to do with speed. You might have really dirty filters. So talk to him about that. Hey, I don't think you're doing a, a good enough job wiping teeth. Our filters are really dirty. And when we leave that on, our filters get plugged up. That's the, spe spe the specific communication that needs to be in, in there so that I can actually start targeting his improvement. Without that, it's just A and there's no solution. Moving on to connect. I think this is a really important piece. I think they're all important. All five of these are really important. They all, 
all contribute to a, a good strategic employee management program. But this part about connecting, it's about people working for people. I don't believe that anybody works for a company. You work for your boss. If you're working for a, a dairy owner, if you're working for a large company, you're not going to quit because you don't like the company. You're going to quit because you don't like your boss or the people working alongside you. And typically, that, the reason that happens is because there's just no connection. I know some guys who don't even know the names of their workers. That kills me. If you don't know the names of your workers, they know that you don't know their names. And when they don't do a routine or if they don't really care about something, it's not because they don't need to earn a paycheck. It's you don't care about them, why should they care about you? I'm not saying that's right, but I know that's what happens. So we start with this, the golden rule, respect. Everybody wants to be treated well. The golden rule. Treat people as, as you would treat others as you would like to be treated. Bottom line, you can live by that when it comes to connecting with your employees. The next two are kind of kind of go together. Assume everyone understands English and watch what you say in minimal swearing. Okay? Once in a while I, I toss out a word or two that I know I shouldn't, but sometimes that's just me trying to connect with the guys. But the point here is I've stood in meetings where a guy says, This kills me. He says, Okay, this, this, and this, but don't tell him that. And then, you know what you just did? These guys understand you. Don't say something you don't want translated. It doesn't need to be translated. You just said it. So if, you're, if there's something you don't want said, don't say it. And if you think it might be a little wrong, even if it's a, a funny joke, don't do it. Because ultimately, your workers want to respect you, and they want to be respected back. Let's just assume that a lot of the stuff that we're talking about is with the dairies here in the U.S. working with Hispanic workers. Okay? The whole Patron system, the workers see you as the Patron, the boss, the person of sort of a fatherly figure, that person wants to trust and respect you. Because that's, that's cultural. You, that's what you do. And when you say things and you do things that take you from this figure down to here, you're not giving them a reason to respect you. So every time you're, you're speaking in front of your team, you can joke around. I'm not saying don't joke around. Let's, everybody wants a, a nice, lighthearted, lighthearted place to work. But we still have to keep that distance a little bit. And not an intimidation factor, but of respect because they want to respect you as a boss. And you need to respect them back. It'll go both ways. Every good relationship is, is reciprocal. And in this case, you can, you can start. Number two, trust. Keep your word. Be honest and genuine. I, I see way too often from one meeting to the next that we say, okay, these three units aren't working. We've got to get scrapers over here. We've got to fix this. You get to the next meeting and nothing gets done. There's no trust built up. There's no follow through. And instead of building sort of that trust bank account where you're putting in your deposits and eventually you know that you can take out some withdrawals, instead of building that, it's just a insufficient funds the whole way through. Because we haven't showed people they can count on our word, they, that they can count on our actions. And a lot of times, those opportunities to build trust are when there's mistakes made. I, a dairy I work with, well, We've been, doing, we've been doing evaluations, this program that I'm going to talk about in a little bit for years. Been doing meetings every month for nine years. I'm always saying customer. And we got, once we started doing these evaluations, we realized, boy, this is going to be tough. Because we got field work, we got holidays, we got this, we got that. We might, you might not get to do these, like we said we would. So what happened the first time? Busy in the field, we didn't do the evaluation like we said we would. So the next time around, we got workers kind of saying, yeah, we missed my evaluation. He missed my 50 cent raise. I'm not going to do it. When we got to the next month, we didn't say anything at that meeting because we didn't realize we missed the evaluation. The worker said, hey, you know, I was supposed to do it last month. Well, that's right, we did. So what, what, how did the owner handle this? He said, well, what should we do? We missed last month. We made a mistake. We went to the worker and said, look, we're going to do it this month in this meeting. And that whole month that we missed, we're going to retropay whatever you earned in that raise. We're going to retropay every hour. So that was like... These guys are working on 60 hours a week. That's like 240 hours times 50 cents. He went back to the whole damn team and said, yeah, he missed my raise. He didn't take advantage of me. He paid all of those hours. In that mistake last month, we totally redeemed ourselves the next month. So now the workers know that even if we miss a, 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 an evaluation, don't worry about it. You'll still get your raise. No sense in fretting. No sense in quitting because you didn't get your evaluation. Go ahead. Trust the guy. Or when we make a mistake on, on payroll, we miss a few hours, that's another opportunity. You can build trust on those mistakes. 
Because the worker's skeptical. They're thinking, ah, this is just another one of these guys who's going to screw me over. I'm not going to get paid. Not necessarily. That next, say it was the same day, actually, some payroll issue. He wrote a check just out of, whether it be petty cash, what he did. He realized the mistake was made, wrote the check, and didn't have to worry about getting to the next payroll on that one day's worth of wages. Every chance that you, you can build trust, build it. Do it. That's your opportunity. Tom, yes. can, can you go back one slide? You bet. Uh, I think if you want to earn respect and trust mm -hmm. as a patron, minimal swearing won't do it. It's no swearing. In their culture, swearing is losing temper, it's lo losing right. faith, and I think you will never recover it. And we are all human, but I think it should really say no swearing. Zero. Yeah, and, and in case? Case. case? Case is right in exactly that point that when we start a little bit, we can totally, we can totally offend somebody. I guess my, my deal is this. I speak Spanish, so I know the power of some of those words. So I know which ones not to use, and I know which ones I can use. Once in a while, I trip up, I'll admit it. But if you don't know those words, you're probably going to mess it up. Because some words sound, you know, it's like, you can drop the F-bomb in front of somebody over here, but if you do that in front of Grandma, that heart, that's really hard in her ears, because nobody says that around Grandma. But maybe your friends, they hear the F-word once in a while, so they don't, it just goes right by them. So if you've got workers hearing you say something that's really offensive and really strong, it's going to lose your respect. So you're right. More zero tolerance on that one, it, you know, especially when you don't know how you're using those words. It's just don't know how offensive it could truly become. Good point. Thank you, guys. So the next one, we can talk about managing and leading. I don't want to get too hung up on the leader part. That could be a whole other seminar the whole time talking about what it is to be a leader. But I look at the leader as their focus being Teamwork. As a leader, you're building a team. You're the coach. You're that guy with a vision. You've got, you've got everything, all the balls in the air. You don't have to worry about every detail with your boots on the ground. You've got to worry about the, the team itself. The manager, however, your biggest focus is on execution. You're the one with the boots on the ground. You're the one walking around seeing what's going on. So what does that mean if you're, leader, if you're the leader and your main focus is teamwork? My biggest issue here is that the lack of teamwork typically is the biggest is the biggest uh, threat to your profitability. You know, we can look at all the data and all the, the numbers and do all the scientific results with your vet and nutritionist, but I see more often that when people don't work together, I don't care what routine you have, what ration you have, what program you have for, for your shots, when people don't want to work together, they create a lot of problems. Just look at the parlor. When you've got, say, a double 20, and I've got these 10 cows, and you've got those 10 cows, and the unit gets kicked off, and those are in your ten cows, and I'm right next to it, and I say, yeah, those are yours. Because I don't like that guy. That's what happens. And if you don't, if you don't work hard to not have that, that breach, that gap in your team, you're paying for it. You know, I need a skid steer, he needs a skid steer, he put the bucket over there, I needed it over there. I, if we don't work on that, we pay for all those mistakes. We pay for those losses. But the funny thing is, as a manager, what you do actually affects the teamwork. There's just a big, what you're going to see, there's this big loop, there's this big vicious circle here. Because the manager, your deal is execution, and the lack of execution is what threatens teamwork. When the morning shift doesn't do this, the night shift gets upset. When the night shift gets behind, then the morning shift is complaining about the night shift. So we've got this thing that if we don't execute our policies, our routines, our procedures, things don't get done. And when things don't get done, we start the blame game, and people are pointing at each other as who's to blame. So if you don't do a good job managing your policies, your procedures, if you don't do a good job managing that, things don't get done, people get upset, teamwork gets eroded, and then we start costing ourselves money. It's just a big, vicious cycle. That's why I want to focus more on being an effective manager. Okay? My favorite type of management Favorite type of leadership, I think, servant leadership, but again, you don't have all day to talk about that. My favorite part of being a good manager, I think it's, it's sort of that um, manager out walking around, where you're out walking around seeing everything going on. There's no time to sit. There's, you just, you're going. You're always looking at something. Sort of like a good waiter. I, just, I, put, an, I put an article in your booklet there that um, I think it was called You're Working for Tips. The idea is that 
A good, a good manager is somebody who can, like a good waiter, good server, can go table to table, bar, kitchen, bar, t- kitchen, table to table, and keep everybody happy. As a manager, you've got so many areas, whether it be the parlor, the freestyle, uh, maternity, you've got all these areas that you need to keep an eye on. So you gotta just keep rolling. You gotta keep seeing everything that's going on. Because if you don't know what's going on, that's, and this is gonna sound a little cynical, but if you don't know what's really truly going on, that's all the ammunition your team needs to show that you that you don't know what's going on and they'll pull the wool over your eyes. So if you're not the one who can say, I know exactly what's going on at my dairy, the workers will tell you another story. And since you don't know any better, you gotta at least believe it, part of it, right? And so you can prove yourself wrong or them wrong or somebody wrong. But if you're out there walking around managing, observing, seeing everything, I say, I think I put a little page uh, uh, on there too, take pictures, what you see, post it. Do everything you can to show everybody that you're kind of like that cop who's always in the, always watching, always there. And I know it's, it's not supposed to be a babysitter role as a manager, but um, oftentimes it is. If you know there's no cops ever on the highway, you can speed all you want. But if you know that there's always going to be somebody out there, what do you think? Look at, your, look at the difference between your first milking and your third milking when nobody's around. There's usually a big difference. People know that nobody's there. Nobody's going to walk in and just surprise you and see what's really, truly going on. The next one is put your system between you and your team. And then manage your systems, ask them why they're not. My deal on this is this. Okay, so we've got, let's just say this is our job description. I know that this is my job because I've got a job description. I don't do all the things in my job description. And then my boss comes to me and says, hey, you're not doing a good job. And I get defensive because that's what we do as people. I get defensive. I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to be told that I didn't do my job. But when my manager shows me my job description and says, hey, you see this with foot baths? Your job is a count over is foot baths? You're not doing the foot baths. Oh yeah, that's my job. Hard to argue that. Instead of making it about me and him, manager, employee, hey, remember this? Remember this is what I'm going to evaluate when you need a raise? Put that between them. I would much rather look at a contract with somebody and say, oh yeah, that's right, we did agree to that, I signed that. But instead of going back and forth bickering over something that doesn't need to be, doesn't need to be discussed. And then asking why and why not. Try to be constructive and take the emotion, out, the emotion out, that's the hardest part, I think. And try to keep the emotion out of, out of an emotional conversation. Why didn't you do it? Why did you do it this way? But ask constructive questions. Do your best to ask, take the emotion out and say, so, well, Instead of accusing that you did it wrong or that this is going to cost this, why did you do it like this? When the protocol says we do it like this, what were you think? What did you see? Did, did, are we missing something? Maybe you did, but chances are it just it's an easy way to open up that communication, and you can figure it out from there. And the most important part about being a manager is adhering to your policies and procedures consistently. What everybody says, cows need consistency, right? Everybody's saying, hey. The thing our cows need most is the same old, same old, same old every day. Consistency. Well, how do cows get consistency if we don't do things consistently? If we change the way we manage every day because it's raining or we got to plow snow or well, maybe not every day, maybe not in Ecuador. But there's always something, right? There's always something that you need to do. So then you say, well, we just won't manage people because something's got to give, right? Something's got to give. So if we're not consistent, there's no way our cows can perform consistent. And that's the biggest thing that I see. We have systems in place, and we've got to dust them off to use them. That's got to be your tool. There's no way you'd go out to uh, clean free stalls without the rake. Your workers might. They might just use your boot. But you know that the right tool needs to be used. You know, we, we just, we can't stop using the systems that we put in place. And if they're good ones, they'll work. Final part. The fifth part of teamwork management, strategic management program, is reward. Now, I, this is more of me just being, a, being covering my tracks here. Everybody, whenever I talk about pay, somebody wants to bust me up and say, hey, it's not always about money. I don't. So I'm going to put it up there just as a disclaimer. Respect, it's, rewarding is also about respect. Workers don't always just, people don't just work for money. They want respect. Without dignity, the other things don't mean much. Jack Welch, uh, ex-CEO of General Electric, he wrote a column for Business Week. They were, he and Susie Welch were doing these columns. 
One of the things is all this time that we're doing all these um, layoffs, how do we let a guy go without making a big problem at the, at the company? Say, well, you know that dignity? Now I'm just paraphrasing here. That dignity that you gave the guy when you wanted him to start working for you, give it to him when you, when you fire him and he has to leave. So the same dignity you provide a guy when he comes in, provide it on the way out and all the way through. So if we don't respect a person, chances are they will leave, regardless of the one you throw at them. Two, recognition. Everybody loves compliments and attaboys. They feel good. The question is, how many times do you give a compliment, a sincere compliment, not just one of those BS, hey, you, nice shirt, Dodger. I know, I mean that. <laughs> I told you not to pick on me, but look what I do. I, I didn't say it. I know, I know. I'm the first one. I know the A sincere compliment. A sincere compliment. When was the last time you got a sincere compliment? Think about that. When was the last time your boss, your spouse, your friends, when was the last time somebody said, you know what, that was an awesome job in that presentation? You did a fantastic job. When was the last time you gave a good compliment? Probably not very often. We just don't. There are a lot of times hard to give or hard to receive, so we just avoid them all together. But I know, the working nine years with, with Hispanic workers on the dairies here in the U.S., there's nothing better than a sincere compliment. The guys, their chest, you can just see, like, they just got a medal. They didn't need a raise. Just a little appreciation, recognition for doing a good job. Fuck. Respect and compliments don't pay the bills. So let's talk a little bit about money. Everyone can use more money. Again, more money isn't always the solution. So I don't want to get in the hole. Hey, you know, I don't think that's always the solution. I agree. But not having enough, I tell you what, that's always a problem. We all know that. So I'm going to talk a few don'ts and then give you a few do's. When it comes to money, don't just give raises based on time. Biggest pet peeve of mine. Well, there's a couple. You can't just base it on, well, every six months we do a 50 cent raise. Really? So I just have to make it six months? Yeah. And then I get 50 cents? Yeah. All right, just don't fire me. See, when we give everyone the same raise, again, don't do that. There's no incentive to do anything better. And I don't want to get all political here about socialism, but what we create when we do that is we show the good workers, we show the workers who want to do a good job, that it doesn't matter because you'll get paid just as much as a guy who does half of what he does. And I hear guys say, well, I got workers that do just enough not to quit, or not to get fired. And I say, you know what? You treat them just enough, just poorly enough so they don't quit. So it's no wonder we got guys who do just enough to not get fired because we just do enough so they don't quit. So let's figure that out. We can't pay the same. Bottom line, everybody says, yeah, but it's, it's so much easier. Everybody gets 50 cents and everybody's fine. No, the guy who doesn't do his job, right? He's fine. Because he's laughing all the way to the bank that I don't even do my work and I got the same as the guy who sweats all day trying to do everything perfectly. I couldn't imagine being the guy who has to see the, the, the co-worker taking in the same kind of pay doing half the work I do, and I'm picking up his slack. What it does is it takes away the incentive to do better. The good worker eventually either quits, because that's what good workers do. They don't want to be frustrated with these guys who don't do a good job. They quit and they go somewhere else. The bad worker brings in his body, and you know what? Mm -hmm. Birds of a feather, they flock together. So now you've just lowered the bar. Or maybe your good worker that you you fought so hard and get one out of ten, because typically one out of ten is a good hire. Those other nine that you had to lead through to get to that one, that one just starts sinking and sinking and sinking to the lowest, the lowest bar of performance that you will accept. So you, as a manager, just show people that um, performance doesn't, doesn't really matter in your work. The next one is this. Now this might sound a little, um, little harsh, but don't give in to employee requests, demands, or uh, <coughs> Or it threats for more money. I know sometimes you're back in the corner, it's Saturday, you're trying to get ready for a family wedding, and all of a sudden the knock on the door is, I need more money right quick. And you're so tempted to do it. But if you would have a system in place that would work, you don't have to do that. And that's what we're going to talk about in just a bit. If you have employees that push you in a corner and demand more money, and then you break, you, you break down and you do it, it's only a matter of time for another knock at the door. Hey, one got a raise. I want one too, or I'll quit. So what do you do? You've trained, like, we train cows to do what we want. You've trained employees to do what we don't want. Oops. Sometimes that happens. Because we were 
the buying? Because he didn't want to say no, because he said he'd quit. So we can't just allow that um, that whole piece of uh, of compensation of, of how we do things to be dictated by maybe a, a, a weekend wedding or somebody who just quit. Because we have extra turnover now, we're just going to start changing our rules just to keep people in the door. Okay. So. What we want to do, and in your booklet, you've got something that says there's three pieces that need to be connected. Go back to your tools. Remember I said I talked about the job descriptions, evaluation schedule, and the, the pay scale? Those are the three pieces that you can use to have a really solid pay program, compensation program. Everybody gets a job description from day one. All the job responsibilities need to be in there. We talk about what the rules are, what the uh, expectations are. We let them know from start to finish, hey, you start here, eight bucks an hour, you can top out at 12. You need to have that top number. Everybody says, well, I don't know if I want to put it out there. You know that there's a top number, right? I mean, you, you don't have the bank mind that you might pay this guy $20 an hour. You're not thinking, oh, this guy could possibly make the 30. No, you know it's around 12 or 11 or 10 or whatever that is. But you want to set it up high enough so that you don't have to change it all the time. You don't want to always have to be like, oh, shoot, you know, Cross that out and put another 50 cents on it. Maybe you could, because this guy's at 10.50, we're going to have to move it to 11. We don't want to keep doing that. So what we do, we hire a guy and say, here's your job description. This is what you got to do. Here's the pay scale. At three months, at six months, at 12 months, you're eligible for a raise. We don't tell them that you'll get a raise, you're eligible for a raise. And you're eligible for an up to 50 cent raise. I like 50 cents, because the only way that the system works is by not giving the whole thing all the time. If a guy's a really good employee, he gets 50 cents. But we explain why. We don't just put it on a check, otherwise it's just an increase in cost of production. It needs to be an investment. Pay raises are, can be one of two things. An automatic increase in cost of production or an investment. It's only an investment when we tie it to performance. It'll never, you can't just throw it a raise on a check and think a guy will understand that he's doing a really good job. He's thinking, well, it's about damn time you were so cheap these last couple months. Fine. And maybe you work. I don't know. But the point is, if a person understands how that worked, then they know how to do it again. And I tell everybody, if you have your 50 cent raise, you want to pay 50 cents. The only reason you pay 50 cents is because he's doing everything on his job description. I have some guys who said, no, I don't want to do the full amount. Yeah, you do. If you do a full amount, that means he's doing the full list on his job description. He's showing up on time. He's following routines. He's being careful and, and respectful with the animals. He's a good teammate. He cleans up. If you give 50 cents, it means he did all those things that you asked him to do. If you give less than that, you can do it. And that's okay too, because that's when the system works. If everybody gets 50 cents, performance doesn't get recognized. If you say, hey, you know, he did a lot of things well, and a lot of things not so well, but I think you're on the right track where you go half of 50 cents. 25. I can walk away with a 25 cent raise, tell his buddies he got a quarter raise, and everybody says, oh, that's not bad. But if you started at the most you could do is 25 cents, that's why I like 50. If you start at 25 and say, well, no, you can do everything right, and not everything's bad, here's half of 25, and who's going to take 12.5 cents and be happy with that? They're going to walk right out your door, and you'll never have a chance to prove what you needed to improve. But 50 cents to a quarter, there's a lot of room for improvement. The guy can walk away and say, you know, that's not so bad. You give a guy 40 cents. Maybe at the next month you say, you know what? Yeah, you did a good job working on those things you asked you to do. The next review, I tell you what, that's in six months or in three months from now, that'll be your six month point. You're eligible for 50 cents again like the last time. If you keep doing what you're doing right now, this is informal communication, you keep doing what you're doing right now, those 10 cents that we miss, we'll tack it on the next time. You'll get more, more trust, you'll get more performance, and guys will realize, hey, it does matter. Because there's a difference in just milking cows or just taking care of animals and doing a good job at it. What I tell everybody is this. Okay, let's just use this double 20 parlor, two people milking, one person milking cows, right? $8 an hour. Let's just say everybody started today and they're all in there. $8 an hour is where they're starting. That's $24 an hour to milk cows. To get them up to the parlor, get them in the, prepped up, and through. Say $25 an hour to milk cows. We haven't even talked about if they did a good job, right? That's just to get them milk. We haven't, I haven't mentioned that, oh, by the way, that guy who's moving them, he left a lot of cows that didn't want to get up. He just left them in the stalls. He's bad at chaining gates, so he got a lot of mixed up cows. The milkers, 
They like going to the holding area, so we're breaking all the rules in the holding area, you know, by the holding area. And um, we didn't even script, we didn't even, uh, we didn't even in free to any of them because we were in a hurry. So for 25 bucks an hour, you get your cows milked, right? What would it cost to get them right milked correctly? It's sort of like if you go to a ball game, the ticket, you got to pay the ticket to get in. Whether or not they win, who knows? But the price of admission is what you got to pay anyway. I, I put in that notebook, you got to pay your employee something, right? They won't work for free. So how about we pay them so that they do a good job? That's the idea. So when it comes to the whole pay for performance thing, you got your job description, you got your pay scale, and then the final piece, real quick, is the evaluation. That evaluation doesn't have to be complicated. In fact, I like it's really simple. I, I put that in there when I use. Um, the first section is thank you for. The bottom section is room for improvement. We put our comments on thank you for. I'm not a big fan of those one, two, three, fours, fives. Because you know what? We always circle the three in the middle and maybe a four. Once in a while a five because that was easy. But we never really put any thought into it. And a worker just sees it and now they want to fight for why is it a three when it should have been a four? Or he got a four and I got a, or I got a three. Make it subjective. Just say, look, you're doing a really good job of this, keep it up. If you keep doing this, the next review, three months, it could be a good one, but you gotta improve what's at the bottom of the sheet. And if you improve this and you keep doing this, you'll get your 50 cents. It's really easy, a really easy way to, to talk about those things. Okay? So that brings us to the last part. We've got five things to be better managers. Five, five ways. We organize our systems. We communicate our expectations. We connect with our people. We manage and lead diligently, daily, every day. We be out there making sure you know and everybody else knows that you know what's going on. And finally, we reward one. We reward performance. We recognize the good and the bad. Because that's where, that's where the rubber meets the road. Okay? So, not one of these is more important than the others. We have to do them all. Just telling your workers what to do. Just paying them more. Just having a, the, all the pieces in, in, a, in a file cabinet so that we know what to do. It's not, not enough to cut. Five principles. Build your team. Make them a winning team. And there you are. Okay? But at the very end, I want to at least give you a few things to, to, to take home. You've got the presentation manual. The little booklet. I want to hand out a few little <coughs> notebooks that I put together for, uh, for basically it's common. People who are on the farms. But like it says up there, there is a little bit of a catch. I handed out a little card in the beginning. I sent out a weekly uh, employee management uh, email. If hopefully you like what you heard today and you like that booklet. But what I what I do is um every Tuesday morning you, you get an email from me. You've got a lot of them in that book right now. I included things that pertain to what we're talking about. I'm hoping you'll fill that out, give me an email address, and come on up. I want to give you a couple booklets that we put together. They're um they're in English and Spanish. It says, help a cow tell us now. It's a, um, it's a notebook that has a name and date, and then three categories. <coughs> Sick cows, cows in heat, and lame cows. So instead of guys just writing down numbers, or taking their gloves off and just giving you dirty gloves and numbers on, you actually have, you actually have something that says, hey, here's three categories of cows that need attention. As soon as you see those numbers, you know what's going on. You at least can get to the right place to do something about it, okay? So I'm hoping you'll turn in those cards and come up for a couple notebooks. And at the very end, one more thing. I do want to thank the sponsor of the event, Eagle Lab, and the Eagle Lab Network, for uh, nine years now. And they were generous enough to support this program and help me put all these things together and, and keep, uh, keep the energy alive and, and employee management. I love what I do, I know you guys do too, and I really want to thank you guys, not just for taking an hour of work of time out of your day at the Parent Expo, but every day you guys, you're working your tail off, no prices are down, and you guys keep plugging away. I want to thank you for all that you do for our country, all that you do for our, our, our communities, thank you for being the dairy producers in charge.